of the House of Usher, Mike Flanagan's final Netflix project, and honestly, it's pretty darn good. Really good, some might say. I think it's finally back on the track that people seem to prefer Flanagan in, and like, while it's not part of that like haunting saga with Hill House or a Blind Manor, it definitely feels like it belongs more in that family compared to his more recent outings. Though honestly, it hits some disturbing areas that neither of those go to. Nothing as graphic as Saw or Hostel, but you know, there's some moments. Which is probably to be expected because the fall of the House of Usher is based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe. But even though I knew that was a thing the first time I saw this, I couldn't stop thinking, what the hell did Usher do? And why is Mike Flanagan telling the story? But no, no nothing happened to Usher. I, I, I don't think anything happened to Usher. Point being, if you're someone who preferred the haunting series versus something like Midnight Mass or Midnight Club, this show should be way more up your alley. It never gets as emotionally or hauntingly beautiful as Blind Manor because that's not what it's going for and you won't care about this family anywhere near as much as you care about the cranes, but it will still find a way to deliver that subtle little Mike Flanagan gut punch at the end. But this isn't a story seeking to show you these flawed characters in a way that helps you gain empathy for them. This is more about the destructive nature of power, how it'll never be enough, how you can do your family from greed and justify it as a birthright. Ultimately corrupting them with all those choices, but maybe they never had a chance anyway. Because these people are not good and they genuinely believe that the world around them is theirs simply because they can pay for it. And much like Blind Manor was the amalgamation of Henry James stories, The Fall of the House of Usher uses that post story, two men in a dilapidated home telling a story as the noises of the home build and build, but instead of a dragon story, we're being told about what's happened to Roderick Usher's children, whose stories inspiration from other works of Poe. And it really is just delightful how they managed to infuse all those different aspects into the story, keeping things fresh, but if you're familiar with Poe, the episode titles will give you an indication of what to expect. But even if you're not at all familiar with his work, the show does a great job setting things up so you'll get those familiar feelings of dread waiting for the tragedy to strike. It is very satisfying, unsettling, and honestly at times nauseating. It definitely gets more graphic in areas than I feel like we've experienced with the other Mike Flanagan series. Like It does a lot with the sound design though. I swear, half the time something gross happens, they just make it worse because of what you can hear. I will say though, there is a bit of the first episode that kind of started losing me, so I was a little bit worried, but once it picks up, it doesn't really stop. I will say that there are aspects of the story that I enjoy more and different characters that I prefer to be focused in on, and I think that like the further it gets into the episodes, I am more interested in this past story that's being told versus what we're experiencing in the present. I'm not entirely sure if there is a way to avoid that, but overall, very enjoyable. I still prefer Blind Manor and Hill House, but this is a very solid third for me. So before we dive into some of those specifics of the episodes, the general spoiler-free premise. I'm sure by now it's already been said a ton, but it is because it's kind of true. This really does feel like a modern day Poe took a stab at succession, but with a few more kids to fuck up. Though still quite different because while the environment has been set up for the competition between these siblings to gain their father's favor, the show isn't really interested in focusing in on that because it's not the point. The point are some of the choices being made. The Usher family owned Fortunato, a farm pharmaceutical company involved in painkillers they claimed aren't addictive, which I think is just a delightful modern backdrop. Fortunato is also the name of a Poe character, which we will round back to by the end. So this is not a family that we should be rooting for. Their company is on trial for false claims made about the safety of their painkiller, Ligodone, obviously paralleling real life drugs like Oxy and Fentanyl and the monsters who lied to us so they could line their pocketbooks. No side effects, non-addictive. In this little pill is a world without pain. And honestly, it may not be the traditional route for horror, but the opioid epidemic is pretty damn horrific. Pretty sure that this family is based on the Sackler family who received immunity for their contribution to the epidemic. Fuck you very much. But to the story, the head of the Usher family is Roderick Usher, CEO of Fortunato who has six children from five different women, but has a super strong commitment to that blood. Doesn't matter how you were born, if you're an Usher, the gates are always open. He and his twin sister, Madeline, were the result of an affair between their mother and the original owner of Fortunato who refused to acknowledge them, which Madeline sees as a denial of their birthright. And she's the real powerhouse of this duo. Roderick may be the CEO, but it's really only because Madeline didn't want it and wanted to focus on her tech thing. She is still right there, COO, guiding him through it all. She's also obsessed with the idea of immortality and believes the real key to it would be AI, how it could be used to perfectly mimic human consciousness so you'd never really die. A virtual you that thinks like you, talks like you, 
is you. But before we fully dive in, I'm just going to introduce the rest of the key players. Frederick is his eldest son, not so kindly referred to as Froderick because he's basically a watered-down version of Roderick. He's married to a former model and actress, Morella, and together they have a daughter, Lenore, who's described as the best of the ushers. Tamerlane, or Tammy, is the only other child Roderick had in his marriage. She's married to a fitness influencer named Bill T, so his courses are called Built. We built this body with work and soul. And they're trying to create some rival goop lifestyle company to help put a more positive light on Fortunato. And while she refers Frederick to the other siblings, she still has a lot of hostility towards him because even though he's mainly a useless idiot, he is still slated to take over the company because he's the firstborn. Victorine Lafourcade is the eldest of his illegitimate children. I think she was around when she was younger as well. She's working to develop a heart mesh technology with her girlfriend, Ali Ruiz, which means you are going to see some CGI animal surgery, heads up. Napoleon Usher describes himself as a game developer, but in reality pays people to make video games for him while he enjoys a very popular online social life filled with drugs and cheating. Camille Espana is the family's head of public relations, and she is highly effective at maintaining that image and finding any info she'd need as leverage. And finally, Prospero Usher, the youngest of Roderick's known surprise children who lives a life even more drug and party filled than Leo's. And even though the Fortunato Company has seemingly been caught dead to rights in multiple instances of wrongdoing, they have a fixer, Arthur Pym, fantastically played by Mark Hamill. Then we have attorney C. August Dupin, based on Poe's iconic detective who spent most of his life trying to prosecute Fortunato, and specifically, Roderick Usher. Now, Poe fans will notice that all of these character names match characters in Poe's stories, and in some of the situations, those character traits will carry over, or at least themes and aspects of their story. And the final character I mentioned, who I don't actually think has a counterpoint in the stories, is Juno, Roderick's very young wife who's seen as a miracle. She takes an exorbitant amount of ligonone due to a car accident after being addicted to heroin, and it doesn't seem to negatively affect her in any way. But we'll learn to Roderick she's basically a glorified trophy that can sexually satisfy him. I'm telling you, man, horrible people. Now, if you don't want any spoilers for literally how this episode starts, I would hop off now, even though this isn't considered a spoiler. It is just the premise of the show. I mentioned earlier that this story seems to set up a succession-style sibling rivalry, but then seems uninterested in fully following through. And that's because they're all dead. In the past two weeks, every single Usher child has died in a series of freak accidents, and as Roderick is telling Dupin the why behind the deaths, their ghosts will pop up to haunt him. And honestly, us? Your energy into kickball. It doesn't over-rely on jump scares, so when they happen, they are very effective. And while the show absolutely spends a good deal of time showing you how these deaths happen, overall it is more concerned with the why they happened. And it really just does do a great job with the atmosphere, the chilling creep, the outright horror to the disturbing as it works us through these terrible demises, and why Roderick ultimately feels he's to blame. So let's dive into the show! And episode-wise, it's a little bit of a sandwich. We've got the overall where are we and how do we get here first and last episodes with these six episodes in between building on those aspects. While working through each of the brutal deaths. So what I'm gonna do is give you the setup, some glimmers of the past, but then wait until the end to tie it all together. So right from the start, we know that everything is gonna link back to something that happened on New Year's 1980 before it picks up at the funeral of the final three Usher children. Because that is the fall of the House of Usher. All of his children, their legacy, dying before his very eyes as we learn he's being haunted by visions of their corpses. And yeah, it's corpses, not just their ghosts. As well as visits from a mysterious woman in a raven mask and the the occasional jester. So right off the bat, we are cooking! As mentioned, the family, or more specifically the Fortunato Company, is on trial, and prior to the dust starting, August Dupin revealed that he had an informant feeding him inside information, implying it's one of the kids. Leaving one to question if these freak accidents were accidents at all, even though nothing is linking them together. So when Roderick Usher invites Dupin over to the house he grew up in, Dupin's curiosity gets the best of him. He's been trying to nail Roderick for decades, and now, after all that's happened, maybe Roderick's finally willing to give something up. But it's not gonna be the confession he expects. Roderick's explanation of everything that's happened brings them all the way back to 1953 to set the stage of how the Ushers became who they are, a family as rich and powerful as royalty, who kinda believe that's what they are, 
they started from nothing. But these moments explain Roderick and Madeline's upbringing, knowing their mother's boss, Mr. Longfellow, is their father, how she got sick with a form of dementia and died, how he was this horrible man right to the end that refused to do anything for her or them. But following the death to avoid her being embalmed, which goes against her religion, they decide to bury her in the backyard. But as is often the case in Poe's story, she wasn't quite as dead as they believed. And in the night, she breaks out of her grave, no longer the woman who would defend Longfellow's cruelty and neglect his greatness. And her final act was strangling this man that treated her so poorly to death in a fit of rage. The last thing my mother did in this life was kill a powerful man, and we carried that secret with us. She was remarkable. Though it is very interesting that he described her killing a very powerful man as remarkable with what's to come. Why are you telling me this? Oh, I assume that I'm supposed to because she's here. She's right behind you which sets us up with the knowledge that every time he's telling a piece of this story, whoever he's focused on is in the room with him. This is what happened. How could you know that? I know because they told me. Before they died? No, not before. Bringing us to the events leading into those deaths. Dupin's reveal kicks off a scene that feels like it could be out of Knives Out as each of the children debate with their partners who the informant might be. A mole is like Leonardo DiCaprio in The Departed. And an informant is like Jack Nicholson in The Departed. There are other movies, Dad. Not as good as The Departed. My money is on one of the bastards. We're gonna find out who's talking to the feds, and then I'm gonna freeze their fucking head, and I'm gonna give it to my father on a platinum plate. See if Cartier will make a platinum plate. And we really reaffirm that none of them really like each other. Tammy refers to all the illegitimate children as the bastards and has even less respect for Fred. Frederick is about as close to Roderick as you get without a junior. And we learn that they all kind of do these weird things, or things that are morally questionable, or just flat out horrific and wrong. Vic is willing to do anything to get the heart mesh technology approved, including experimenting with illegal nightshade paralytics, which comes back down the line, injecting the chimps with adrenaline to keep their hearts pumping after the surgery. Then there's rumors of her switching out live chimps for the ones that died in surgery to make the studies seem more successful, and then comes back later at night to fish the tech out of the bodies before dismembering and sneaking them out in her purse. With her drippy Birkin bag full of monkey bits. Camille doesn't just dress her fancy little assistants here up in matching outfits while having them do her dirty work. Name isn't Tina, you know that my name is Beth. I don't give a shit. Toby and fucking Tina makes me laugh at work. You're fucking Tina. They also literally have to do her dirty work. They have these weird little open door rooms that lead into one central bed where they all smash. Yeah, I don't care what kind of NDA or consent form you signed. I don't think you can get away with that. Tammy has this weird dominant cuck dynamic going on where she hires sex workers to pretend to be her and watches her husband interact with them. It seems like a way to just witness some validation being expressed towards her without actually having to engage in any of it while still having total control. And then yeah, it also gets sexual. Leo cheats on his partners and absolutely consumes too many drugs. And Prospero just wants the entire world to work as a full fest that he's in control of. Fred's bigger sins are gonna come down the line. For now, he's mostly a puppet. The only usher with any good in them is the granddaughter, Lenore, who naively states that, hey, something bad is happening. Isn't it good that someone's telling the truth? That is a brave and thoughtful thing to say. Especially if you wanna get written out of the will all leading into a family dinner where he's placed a $50 million bounty for whoever can find the informant. And a particularly harsh NDA, which was just for appearances, Madeline has much more severe plans for the guilty party. By neutralized him and sued into oblivion. My dad left to sue the bloody puddle of gore in the designer's shoes. And to the rest of you, happy hunting. So kind of seems like they're setting up for the bloodbath that ensued, but it's a lot more sinister. And while none of the deaths can be linked, Roderick maintains that he's responsible, along with a woman. Our mysterious raven, Verna, a bartender, that night they were ringing in 1980, a night we know they've done something terrible, which appears to be the turning point of them taking over the Fortunato company. Want to start a tab? Buy now, pay later. What I say. This is a very important little clue of what's to come. A conversation comes up about how ravens were seen as minions of Satan because they survived being thrown off Noah's Ark. But she'll argue that they're not bad omens in every culture. A lot of people believe ravens bring good fortune. But at what cost will that fortune come? The real quick, I just have to mention that it is super weird that they are dressed as Jay Gatsby and Daisy. There are some incestuous implications in the original Poe story. And while there's nothing overt happening here in the show, it definitely feels like a nod in that direction. They do get close in very particular ways because of how they were raised and the fact that they're twins. But uh, Madeline has a very strong foothold on Roderick their entire lives. But this is a woman who will have personal run-ins with each of the Usher children, different circumstances every time, but always seeming 
seemingly trying to offer them up some degree of salvation. Just something, whether possible or not. A key element that gets brought up in the story is the idea of resolutions. Deals you make with your future, the firm decision to do or not do a thing, and how that'll come back around later. And on that night, they claim their resolution was to change the world. But as we all hopefully know, there are multiple ways to change the world, and they do not have to be positive. Now, one of the key aspects of Poe's House of Usher story is that Roderick Usher is afflicted with some kind of unnamed illness, that the decay of the house is matching the decay of his body, the unavoidable death, and that is no exception here. Our Roderick Usher is unwell, apparently suffering from the same illness his mother died from, which was a form of vascular dementia, meaning there is a clear argument to be made that the things he's seeing are just guilt manifestations in his mind. Something he believes to be true, but there definitely seems to be more going on, even if he still has plenty of guilt to torment him. But let's jump into the deaths, which is kind of like a domino effect in reverse birth order, starting with Perry, who's described as above all else, crazy. And honestly, kind of an idiot. Holy shit, we own all of these? Are you acknowledging ownership? Some of these are a fucking gold mine. If this one is ours, I want to see it. Dude's literally treating a deposition like a real estate meeting. Now he's so interested because Roderick will fund a business venture for any of his children. They just have to pitch it. But Perry's hedonistic nightclub venture doesn't match the family ideals. I'm, I'm selling hedonism. Privilege. We're gonna turn movie stars and monarchs away with attitude. Where the movie star that everybody fucking worships is busy giving head to, to, to the real VIPs. Being an usher is about changing the fucking world. It's not a blowjob whiskey bar. What I find interesting about that statement is that later on, when showing off the sapphire eyes of Queen Tusrit, he bribed out of Egypt as a gift for Madeline. He clearly has the same sentiments as Perry. That their wealth makes them the real royalty. I reached through time and ripped the eyes out of a goddess with my pocket good book and some patience. Does that make me a god? So Perry just decides he's gonna usurp one of these illegal buildings to beta test his idea and prove Roderick and Madeline wrong, while also inviting Freddy's wife in hopes of humiliating him with the evidence. Nobody sucks or fucks until the rain starts. And they set up his demise so well. They keep focusing on the sprinklers. They're specifically told that there's no water, so he wants to connect them to what he assumes are water reservoirs on the roof. But the reason we've been told they'd be in shit if they owned this building is because it is one of many responsible for leaking toxic chemicals into the ground. If he paid any attention at all, he'd know that this building specifically was used to conceal highly acidic chemicals. Because when Perry starts the rain, corrosive chemicals fall from above and the entire crowd's flesh starts to burn. Off. And it's really the sound that has the impact more so than what you see, just the sound of the flesh melting, sticking to other bodies as they move around in slow agony, dying. It's honestly a little bit nauseating. Now, as his name and the episode title reveal, Prospero Usher's story is inspired by the Mask of Red Death, where a group of nobles are hiding away inside an abbey owned by a prince from an illness outside, before a mysterious figure dressed as the Red Death itself turns up at their masquerade. When Prospero goes to confront this individual's poor taste, he drops dead before it's revealed that there is never anything beneath the robes. The guest was Red Death itself, killing all the guests because you can't cheat death. Our Red Death guest in the show was replaced by our Raven, and she seems to offer him up a chance to stop this particular incident from happening, but it all seems like it's too late. Things like this have consequences. Not this. There are always consequences. Both Prosperos believe their money affords them a life free of consequence, but the Raven points out that he is consequence, the consequence of Roderick's choices. Leaving Perry's body with a single mask to let the family know that someone was there after it all went down. But somehow Freddy's wife is still alive even though she didn't leave when warned. But it starts to slowly push Freddy to lose his mind over why his wife was at a sex party his brother was hosting. Which we will get to, what we know now is that the show isn't fucking around, so when the next episode starts with the sound of chip screams, I already started to feel a little bit unwell because Camille already made a Rue Morgue joke in the last episode because it's Roderick Usher experiments. And Rue Morgue is one of the post stories I was already familiar with, so I know that someone's getting fucked up by an ape this episode. And it's gonna be Camille because that's the story her character name is from. And look at these creepy hands massaging Roderick's shoulders. Oh, it's so chilling. It's kind of the beauty of already knowing these people are dead. You can just kind of use them ahead of time. Now, because none of them actually care that Perry is dead, Camille is right back to trying to find the informant. And because of her fixation on Vic, she wants to figure out if those rumors about faking research data with the chimps is true. Then maybe the feds caught on and she cut a deal. But sadly, she no longer has her assistance once they decide they no longer want to partake in the sexual aspect of their dynamic. Oh my God, you fucking children. You're in love. It just happened. Don't minimize it. I will not be able to fuck either of you from here on out without laughing, so 
Boom, we're done. God, Kate is magnificent. Obviously, their entire arrangement is unethical, but the scene is hilarious. The fact that they didn't realize she'd let them go when this is a full service job. But with them gone, she has to do her own dirty work and goes to snoop around the research facility herself, which is when she has her meeting with the Raven. Roger Usher is my father. Of course I know who you are. You're the clever one, but you shouldn't be here. And you don't have to be here. A lately ominous delivery that Camille wouldn't catch. This is her final chance to leave, but obviously that doesn't happen. It doesn't matter that Vic's actually pumping the gyms with adrenaline to keep them alive. Camille doesn't actually care about that. Camille shouldn't be here, so that's how it's gonna go down. So the whole speech about how we misuse animals for testing absolutely should have been saved for Vic. It could have happened quiet, peaceful, in bed. I guess it's gotta happen like this. I'm sorry. It's not personal. And her reaction to knowing she's gonna die is like kind of amazing. Fuck it, I got mine. And then I just love how she pans up her phone camera and our raven flips to a chimp as it attacks. But man, she got it so bad. Like you can see where she tried to crawl away all the blood, very not cash money. I appreciate the commitment though, and I'm glad they didn't curl her up into a chimney. But it's this moment with Camille that kind of makes it more easy to craft the theory about the raven, the way she talks, the things she says, not including herself in conversations of human nature. I love how deliciously pointlessly mean you lot can be. Obviously the way she always appears as someone slightly different every time and never ages. How she's both fascinated and disgusted by the darker aspects of humanity. I think this is less supernatural and more otherworldly. And it feels like it establishes that these deaths have to happen, just not necessarily the way they're happening. Bringing us to the next episode, The Black Cat, which is a pretty fucked up story where you will see some things happen to a puppet cat, so heads up. Actually, the stuff with the cat started in the last episode, so late heads up. The original black cat story has a man becoming progressively more antagonistic towards a cat named Pluto the more he drinks. He takes its eye out then ends up killing it, feeling so guilty he brings home another stray. But again, he starts to fear and hate this cat, tries to kill it, but his wife stops him so he kills her instead, seals her up in the wall without realizing the cat's in there too, and the noise the cats make lead police right to his wife's body. So this man's deteriorating psyche and morals are directly linked to his increased substance consumption and Leo, loves his substances. Now the black cat, the narrator doesn't have a name as far as I'm aware, so Leo gets his name from the spectacles. And I think the main comparison there would be that Napoleon in the short story changes his name to gain an inheritance. And Leo's one of the bastards who took the usher's last name and then obviously will be getting an inheritance. Now in the previous episode, Leo wakes up from a drug party binge to find blood on his hands, eventually leading him back to the body of his boyfriend's cat, Pluto, that he has massacred. We don't see it happen. We just find a fake bloody cat body on the ground with a knife in it. He manages to convince his boyfriend Julius that they must have accidentally let her out and decides to find a replacement cat, which is when he gets his visit from the Raven. Giving him so many options not to go through with this plan and maybe just pick a different cat in need, but he insists on going with the replacement cat. You little fucker, you saved my life. Oh no, look at her little smirk. Man, two of my faves gonna be dead before the halfway mark? Bomber. Now this episode is largely his rapid decline in sanity. He absolutely loses it when he finds out about Camille. They actually seem to have a solid bond compared to all the other siblings. Fucking robo chip rips off my sister's face and I'm sad enough. Have Tammy or Frederick do your sound bites. Don't call me that. Cut me out of fucking will. Give my share to the next junkie tart you find at the ER. And then he just gets terrorized by this cat that kind of goes a little bit pet cemetery, honestly. No one else can see the cat. It scratches his wrist, his eye, which for some reason he didn't go to the doctor for. Look, if the supernatural things weren't gonna kill him, the toxoplasmosis was gonna take him out. It's leaving dead animals all around the house and he's becoming progressively more unhinged before he gives up and invites the shelter worker to come get her, which is when they realize she's in the wall. Cats are actually apex predators, you know? They're predators because they're Deficient. A lot like your father. Before he can get too caught up on what she's alluding to, the cat attacks him and he pops out its eye like in the short story. Like, yes, it very much looks like a puppet, but I still have no idea why they, they did that. But it cuts back to the raven and now her eye is popped out before she just disappears. Which is a nice little hint that this cat is not actually here. Fuck, Jules. Maybe you're right, maybe. 
Maybe I should take it back from the trucks. Then he just starts smashing through all the walls trying to get to this cat before he launches himself off the balcony in front of Julius as it pans back to show that there are no dead animals in the tub and the real Pluto wanders up to him in the street, Gucci collar and all. Showing us that none of that ever happened, including the initial drug-fueled killing. Long live Pluto. There's a lot of other stuff going on behind the scenes in these episodes, which we will get to, but first, Vic's turn to die. And while the surrounding events are horrific, I do think she gets off pretty easy, all things considered. Now, her episode is called The Telltale Heart, which I feel like most people are familiar with, with the beating heart under the floorboards, but her name comes from the premature burial. Victorine Lafourcade is a woman who is buried alive but manages to escape Escape, which seems to line up more with Roderick and Madeline's mother, who was named Eliza, like Poe's own mother. But Vic's meeting with the Raven actually happened a couple episodes ago. As a woman seeking Dr. Ruiz's help, who just happens to be the perfect candidate for their device. You know, the one that definitely isn't ready for use? And that kind of links us back to Roderick, who's been threatening to cut funding. He was banking on that mesh tech to help with preventative care for his illness, but would need it viable for testing within six months. Vic doesn't know that's why he's so insistent on getting it into human testing, but that doesn't matter. She is more than willing to violate ethics to push things along for her own self-serving reasons, including lying to a woman who's already expressed second thoughts. Victorine has been given so many chances to shut this down, but won't. Because she cares more about what this is going to do for her name than saving lives. So you may be wondering, how could she be telling this woman that a surgery is going to happen? You know, her girlfriend is the main doctor and the heart specialist. She'd have to approve it. Just, there's no way you could have gotten clearance for this. Oh no. Tell me right now that my signature isn't on falsified reports! Shit, how do you think this industry works? Oh, she just lied, like with the adrenaline, because Al definitely doesn't know about that because she openly said it would destroy the study. So obviously she's not going to go along with this, which actually ends up paralleling a situation from the past. Before he was a prosecutor for the DA, Dupin was a fraud investigator, which is how he originally came into contact with Fortunato's wrongdoings, and more specifically, Roderick and Madeline. Back when Roderick was just desperately trying to work his way up the company. He's the one who brought Ligodone to the current CEO, Rufus Griswold, and all he got was a $500 finder's fee and a 15% raise. You walked in here, brain farted, and turned it into $500. But it seems that Rufus may have already been involved in some medical malpractice issues after a series of bodies involved in a drug trial go missing from their graves. So Dupin has suspicions that Fortunato is covering up evidence that would prove they lied to patients about what they were actually doing. And they did this by forging a variety of signature from patients to employees to just prove and confirm that everything was above board. And one of the regularly forged signatures was Roderick's. And mostly he's just scared to pursue this and run the risk of losing his job. But Madeline has other plans. Again, I haven't talked about her very much, but we will do a nice little, we will get to her in due time, but like it is largely her plans and her manipulation to get them to the top. You're gonna go to work. You are going to keep eating that shit. And you're gonna make Rufus Griswold think it's your favorite food. Basically, pretend you don't care about the forged signatures and get the evidence for Dupin. Or so it seems. But back to Vic, who now can't get a hold of Allie and just keeps hearing this weird metal chirping. Slowly starting to drive her insane and no one else can hear it until Roderick comes over and he can, leading us to a room where Al is popped up, chest cut open, blood everywhere, with the device just futilely pumping away on her dead heart because there is no more blood to move. And I don't fucking care if you sue me or you rip me apart! <laughs> Apparently Al hadn't made it through the door before Vic threw the bookend and it just right to the back of the head and honestly it is the sounds of her dying that are worse. Oh, bleh. <laughs> Have you never heard a woman getting eaten out before? Oh god, no, please stop. No! God, once you find out what that noise she keeps hearing is and go back and watch the episode, it just makes you squirmy. You're fully funded. Until she promises to be a team player. Well, she's, she's quite dead. So she had fully snapped over the past day. She was still trying to get a hold of Allie, really in this moment genuinely believed she was still there, before it all comes to a head and Roderick has to watch her stab herself in the heart. Though it was absolutely Verna controlling this event. You know, I wish she just jumped. Maybe then. I wouldn't have to do this. See, before heading to Vic's place to apologize for how he used to pit the kids all together, Roderick thinks the solution to stop all this from happening would be to take his own life. And I suppose even if he's wrong, he doesn't have to be around to see all of his children die. But he can't make himself do it, and thus, here he is, literally having to watch his child die. So, super fucked run of events here, very brutal. Though, in my opinion, having to stab yourself in the heart is a pretty easy way out after you plan to most likely kill a woman with tech that you absolutely knew wasn't ready for human testing. Falsified years of data 
tortured animals killed your partner in a fit of rage because she refused to go along with it? I don't care if the killing was accidental and then the heart stabbing is just like poetic in its disturbing nature. She's the one who should have been mangled by a chimp. And it's so interesting because Roderick is rightfully horrified by what he sees, starts to lose it a little bit in the next episode, but all it takes to instantly ground him is for Madeline to point out that Vic had a board seat, meaning they run the risk of losing control of the company. Vic had a board seat. That family firewall you've always talked about is being dismantled one brick at a time. Pardon the environment change, this video is getting out of hand. It's in these few episodes that Madeline and Roderick realize that the woman appearing at all the deaths seems to be the same woman from the bar all those years ago. But it's not possible, she hasn't aged at all, so Madeline believes it has to be another one of Roderick's scorned bastards. And she doesn't just want her found, she wants her dead. I'll return with a receipt. I'd like it to be her eyes, both of them, extracted. Though Roderick maintains he never touched that bartender, in a conversation he's having with a brick wall. The one we saw back in those opening moments of the show. You must be enjoying this. It's impossible anyway, isn't it? Fuck you too. Leaving us with a little jingle that I'm sure is gonna bring us right back to New Year's Eve 1979 with whatever or whoever is behind that wall. Now earlier I mentioned that Madeline has a focus on immortality but not fame. Money and what it opens up to her is what she cares about and she doesn't need to be famous to have control. You strike me as a queen. Without a crown. And the raven sees it, finally getting Madeline to reveal exactly what she wants. You never let a man have power over me, and I figure out how to live forever. Cheers to you, Cleopatra. Because no one really lives forever. It's not until Pym brings evidence that this woman has been photographed with a variety of modern elites, but then also goes back decades to people like Randolph Hearst and John Francis Queenie. Give me three minutes, I'll give you a photo of Pym blowing Elon Musk. But the photos have been online for ages. There's no way to stage it. Whatever happened all those years ago, the Raven seems ready to collect. And next up on the list is Tammy. Now it's been pretty clear since the death started that the siblings haven't really been sleeping at all. So from Leo on, we're really getting this torment compounded with sleep deprivation, and we're getting that full force with Tammy. So Tammy's actually got two Poe connections. Tamerlane is the name of a poem by Poe that's largely linked to themes of pride and the desire for perfection, which absolutely seems like something Tammy's after in both her personal life and her wellness company, Goldbug. And Goldbug is another Poe story in which the protagonist believes that this gold bug will be the key to restoring his family fortune. In the show, it's less the fortune of money, but Goldbug is supposed to be one of the few positive things the company has to help restore its image, particularly after Vic's murder-suicide. This is important for our company. We need something like Goldbug, something that could be positive. So even though all logic would dictate postponing the Goldbug launch, Tammy needs to prove that she's the most worthy Usher child. Goldbug will show him that the Usher empire should be a matriarchy. But like Vic, Tammy got her raven visit a few episodes ago as a replacement third for their weird little arrangement, and she is perfect at it. I almost texted to ask if you'd do your chicken piccata. Ugh. I just love you. There's definite double meaning in this conversation that Tammy won't catch, but uh, we definitely will. Let's not talk about Perry or the family or anything else. Not tonight. And nice little, you and I are gonna get to all that but not yet. And while that first night went great, a series of events and hallucinations makes Tammy think Bill's cheating on her with Candy. So she completely pushes him away, even though he's the one with the social media following and just refuses to give him any leeway. And the less she sleeps, the worse the hallucinations get, pushing her right over the edge of completely blowing the gold bug pitch. She loses it on stage when she thinks the Raven is replacing her, accidentally plays a piece of their sex tape before beaming Juno in the head with the microphone stand because she thinks it's Candy. All that security for nothing because you can't keep out what isn't human, forcing Madeline to finally accept what they're dealing with. Now, other than shattering her image and the mental anguish, Tammy goes out fairly chill. The Raven antagonizes her ego, points out that she still has time to apologize to Bill. Man, I ain't a lot of ass on your behalf. Maybe just tell him you're sorry. Tormenting her through the mirrors because Tammy is her own greatest enemy. The whole time she's been getting off on watching someone be her, and now that's her torture. I fucked it all up. I fucked it all up. Until finally, she smashes the mirror above her bed, impaling her through the neck, 
and lots of other places. Maybe now you'll all think twice before installing your own kinky sex mirrors. Which brings us to the final Usher child, Frederick. I mentioned that he started losing it when he realized his wife went to a sex party and now he thinks she has been cheating on him, but it pushes him to torture. He pulls her out of the hospital for at-home care, but then never hires a doctor, uses the nightshade Vic had to keep her paralyzed so he can verbally assault her and more for hours on end, all while staying pretty coked up on some stuff Leo had, which is just pushing his psychotic behavior further and further until he literally pulls her teeth out. At this point, he's the minimal line of defense against the board, but he is so useless. He was supposed to have that building torn down a year ago, so it's his fault it was even available for that party. I don't know why it matters so much now. It matters because I have to count on you. It's a fucking crime scene with our family's name all over it. You're it. You see, you're the fucking swing vote. The board swing it? But they need that minimal defense more than anything. Madeline at least needs the board held back long enough to present her artificial consciousness project to them to push Fortunato out of pill pushing into tech. Digital immortality where she would gracefully ascend to the helm of Fortunato while Roderick takes out the bad press with him. Too bad they've all ignored the fact that Fred is losing his damn mind because again, Roderick doesn't really care that all of his children are dying. Though Freddy thinks he cares, thinks he's important and the drugs are giving him a backbone. Because I'm the Usher Ascendant, that ball is gonna swing Swing at 8 p.m. tonight. That building is coming down, or else I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out your fucking teeth with a pair of pliers. Wow, it's almost like he just did that to someone, you sick fuck. Now Fred's name comes from the Metzengerstein, pardon the pronunciation, uh, where the protagonist becomes increasingly cruel, and that cruelty ultimately leads to his death as a horse carries him into a flaming house. And Fred's cruelty absolutely leads to the type of death he has, bringing us to his pit and pendulum demise. The Ravens decided that the torture of his wife has been so egregious that she got personally involved and tricked him into filling his little coke pouch with nightshade so when he goes to piss on the memory of Perry... Rest in pee, fuckface. Ugh. He collapses as the building is demolished around him, a swinging beam getting closer and closer before slicing him open back and forth. And all he can do is look on in horror and feel every second of it. He would have been a dentist. That's what you were gonna be in the other life. That made what you did feel... Worse. Just like that, the final child is dead, the house has fallen, well, almost. It's time to go back. See, all those years ago, it seemed like Roderick was helping August with his case. But taking down Griswold wasn't gonna get them in the position they're in. Madeline always had another plan. When it comes time to testify, Roderick denies all the forgeries, says that August Dupin harassed them, had a vendetta against Griswold, ruins his career, and ends up arrested for perjury. Roderick! Don't say it. A word, not another word, not here, I will meet you at home. But of course the lawyers get him out, he just became the most important man at Fortunato. The one who made the DA look like idiots, the man who saved the company. All of which deeply horrifies his wife, Annabelle Lee. Now I haven't talked about her much, but she is a genuinely kind woman who truly believed the best of her husband. That he was gonna do the right thing for those people that died. He did the right thing, you fucking simpleton. There's a few moments where Madeline and Annabelle's ideals come to a head. Money isn't everything. We're okay. When Madeline is talking about how AI could be indistinguishable from reality, true immortality, Annabelle points out that there's so much an algorithm can't do. Aren't there just some things only we sad little flawed people can do? <laughs> to her, there's no value in that immortality. And those are the two forces pulling on Roderick, and maybe that's a charitable way to put it because I don't think he was ever gonna go against Madeline, but there's the genuine good that is Annabelle. They may never have been rich, but they'd be happy and have a home filled with love. Or Madeline's ideals of birthright and taking what's theirs no matter the cost, changing the world in one way or another. It is your birthright, Roderick, our birthright. Two types of legacy, one of love and another of detached lore. You are so small. <laughs> And we all know how he chose. So she leaves him, takes the kids until they're old enough to be bought off and whatever good they'd had was killed off by the greed. Less and less of them came back each time until one day they were empty, they were siphoned. And without them, Annabelle felt like she had nothing to live for and followed through on that. Something he's reflecting on a lot now, the choices he made that led to a life without her. I look at you and I see you. The poverty of you. The only positive thing in his bloodline is Lenore. All the goodness of Annabelle, but with the fire to fight for it. After finding her mother, even though Pym tries to dictate the narrative, Lenore insists on telling the police exactly what Fred did. Your father died in a horrible accident, but it's important he died upstanding. He abused and mutilated my mother. 
and then went off on drugs, I think, and got himself killed. And if you think you're coming near her with another pair of pliers over my dead body, you fucking ghoul. Something Roderick's very proud of, even though he'd never value that behavior at any other time. But things seem pretty fucked for the ushers, so Madeline goes to bargain. I want new terms, and I shall have new terms. Or have you forgotten what I am? There's my Cleopatra. Whatever the raven is, death, which is kind of where I am, Satan, some level of demon, or just an otherworldly being that doesn't deal in any particular moral, she's fully revealing herself now. You might accuse me of being the broker of suffering. I could say the same of you. But I consider myself more its witness. She knows all the things Madeline was, is, and could be had she not gone down this path. What Roderick would have been, too, a poet. I see all three standing shoulder to shoulder. They break my heart. This is the one challenge that Madeline can't overcome. No matter her obsession with immortality, she can't cheat death. The Raven goes on to recite City in the Sea in a way that seems to parallel the family or the wealthy and greedy at large as that doomed city of sin destined to sink at the hands of death itself from the choices they've made. Madeline just refuses to see that. Her final futile attempt is to get Roderick to kill himself first. Apparently the terms were designed around both of them, but she thinks she can trick that. You're a legend. You're a king. You are saving us all. The Raven isn't done yet. Can't let you out that easy. Bringing us to our finale, what is the jingling, the jester? Why does Roger keep coming back to this wall? What earned the fall of his house? Millions, Roderick. And that's just the death. Your tally is fucking impressive. There's this reverie to what he's done and a horror to how easy it was to achieve. Millions of lives lost, millions more damaged, all from one little pill. A death toll so high that even witnessing the death of all his children and losing his company isn't enough for Dupin. Justice for what you've done. I'll know it when I see it. And I don't know if he ever truly will, but it brings us back to what happened on New Year's 1980. Just as they anticipated, Roderick's the king. Griswold's most trusted right-hand man, and he's made sure to let the whole board know that. There is nobody on the face of this fucking planet that I trust more than you. So long con, Roderick should be fairly set, but that was never the plan. Madeline knows that she is the one thing this man can't have, making it so easy to lure him away. He'll drink whatever she offers him. Missing those subtle notes of cherry. If you can get over here, you can do anything you want to me. Except that's how it's me. Hey. And while I do love that particular moment because this guy is a sick prick. Fuck me anytime you want. Hell, you'll climb that ladder fast. Their final plan, kill Rufus Griswold for trying to fuck them in every conceivable way. And that would still be a horrible thing to do, but they go further. They chain him to a wall and seal it shut, jester mask and all. This brick saying he's so small is gonna be the last thing he ever sees. You are so small. They plan to just play it off as Rufus escaping before the feds could come back around with more evidence, making way for someone more trustworthy in that position, Roderick. I thought he'd be louder. And that's the jingle he keeps hearing. The light movement of Griswold's head as he nods off from the cyanide. Tying back to the company name, Fortunato. In Poe's work, Fortunato is a character from the cask of Amontillado who's lured into a trap by a friend seeking revenge. Just like Griswold's proclaimed expertise in wine backfires on him, the same happens to Fortunato. I really can't believe he didn't taste it. He really didn't know shit. And just like Griswold, he ends up chained alive inside a wall, leaving nothing behind but the occasional jingle from his costume. In the story, we're not sure why Montresor is so angry at Fortunato making his fate seem extreme, but even knowing the usher's grievances, this is excessive. Though the Montresor family crest in the story translate to no one provokes me with impunity, and that really seems to match these two, particularly Madeline. They could have dealt with Griswold in a lot of ways. They chose the one where he dies a slow death encased in a wall. The one that gets them what they believe they're owed. Quick note, Griswold's name comes from Poe's real-life rival who would continue to tarnish Poe's reputation after his death, but they head to the bar for their extended alibi and the decision that would once again change their lives forever. The Raven asks what they'd give to have everything they ever wanted in life and reveals that she knows exactly what they did. What if I said I could guarantee that you'll get away with it? That they'd be the king and queen of Fortunato, no legal repercussions, which is good because I don't think their plan was foolproof. She just wants to see what they'd do with it. You're gonna say it costs what, Art? 
souls or whatever no such thing and even if there was you already sold them tonight one brick at a time no it's an offer that seems too good to be true if you're like these people they can pass it off to the next generation that just before roderick's natural death his bloodline would die with him including madeline you came into this world together and you go out of it together i'm a creature of symmetry and they delude themselves into thinking that 30 to 40 years of wanting for nothing would be better for the kids than 70 years of uncertainty really easy to make that mentality shake out when you're motivated motivated by greed, toasting it off with the same cognac Roderick's been drinking the entire night. You drink this on the best day of your life or your last night on earth. And before they clear the street, the bar's gone, leaving them questioning their sanity until they ignore anything that may or may not have happened that night, even though their lives play out exactly as she promised. And honestly, even if you did think you just got a little bit too drunk, pretty fucked up to keep having kids, Roderick. So it's an interesting deal, one that only seems to present itself after someone's done something horrible, less of a bargain for a soul that would already be condemned and more of an offering to cheat responsibility for a period of time. And the brutality of that collecting seems directly related to how each of these people behaves. Though we do find it interesting that she seems to present them all with like choices before their death, that Perry could have stopped more people from dying, that Camille could have had a peaceful death. I think it really just does come down to choices and consequences. It's really what the whole show comes down to. Now before we spiral into our conclusion, it's time to talk about Arthur Pym a bit. A man who took part in the Transglobe expedition, sharing stories but never how it ended. I like to think he killed someone. I like to think he's eaten human flesh. He also originates from the work of Poe, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, and apparently the race even was a witness to this voyage. You really don't remember me. She starts to hint at the many atrocities that were committed on their voyage, things he didn't do but saw. We're a virus. People, I mean. And that statement is another key to so much of this show, the human virus that so often destroys everything around it, the world, animals, people, ourselves. Both Pims saw the atrocities humanity is capable of, but she found them so interesting that she had to go topside, as she puts it, and knows he saw her there on the ice. Which I love because the last thing Poe's Pim sees before the story ends is a huge shrouded white figure and we don't know what its intentions are. And that seems to match our Raven so perfectly. She offers the world to people who see to use that good fortune for horrible things in exchange for what seems like certain destruction and a cost they're not willing to acknowledge. And now she's here to make a deal with him. If the Usher Empire is falling, so is his protection. When I'm done, you can stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and it won't cost you a thing. Ooh. Ooh, that was a Trump dig. Anyway, uh, for the things he's done, Pim could get 20 years. Camille had an entire file and the Raven can decide whether that file is ever found. But Pim's lived a life without leverage, so why stop now? I think I'll play on my hand. It's all the same to you. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. But it's not over yet. I think it was really easy to get caught up on the idea of kicking it down to the next generation, but she specified the entire bloodline. Meaning Lenore, tragically as indicated by her name, no matter how good she is, is not spared. There's a lot about my job I love, but there are moments like these that Bring me no joy. This is our Flanagan gut stab, which comes with a final kindness. The Raven shares that Morella, her mom, makes a full recovery after years of fighting and immediately uses the inheritance for good, donates to abuse charities, sets up the Lenore Foundation, within a decade saves three million lives before it becomes too hard to count. You did that when you defied your father. You saved those people. That choice you made echoes through millions of lives before delicately ending her life. Now this part of the story confuses Dupin. Lenore's not dead, she's been texting Roderick all night. They'll come, she'll stop texting. And that, friends, is where the knife gets twisted. Apparently tonight is when Madeline's artificial consciousness experiment went live, but all this Lenore bot can do, just like the raven of Poe's story, is text Nevermore over and over. Tormented by that one word, realizing he'll never know peace from the grief. The one death he actually cared about, the one person who could make the Usher name good. What is interesting, even with the regret he's expressed, it doesn't seem to extend to the choices he's made, the pill he pushed to market. To the end, he tried to deflect the blame distance himself from what those drugs did, that it's their fault for abusing it. I didn't make the drug. I didn't design the drug. I'm just as much a victim of it as anybody else. Oh, honey. Don't kid a kidder. Ushers think they deserve the world because they did things to change it. It may not have been perfect, but you can't say we didn't change the world. How many people can say that? But none of them except maybe Madeline make anything. Roderick found a chemist who made a pill and got rich. Vic found a scientist who made a heart mesh and piggybacked. Tammy found a fitness influencer. Leo pays video game developers. They don't make things. They just feel entitled to it all. I've worked with a lot of 
truly influential people over the years, but when it comes to sheer body count, you're in my top five. That's his legacy, a never-ending pile of bodies with one to go. Madeline, who rejects the idea that they're the problem, the only reason they can do what they do is because the consumers flock to it. They fucking invented us. They beg for us, they're begging for us still. We are now rounding back to our House of Usher's story. He's poisoned her the same way they poisoned Griswold all those years ago and prepares her for a queen's death, replacing her eyes with sapphires. You are a queen. You're a goddess. And you're gonna live forever. Blake, their mother, all those years ago, Madeline isn't quite dead, and she's slowly been working her way out of her tomb the whole season. And in those final moments, Roderick does admit that he knew all along that he was rising to riches on a tower of corpses, that there's no such thing as painkillers. Imagine if we put that on the bottle. I bet I still could have sold it. As Madeline makes it up the stairs, Roderick utters his final nevermore. There is no future here, there is no peace. She strangles Roderick, just like their mother all those years ago, as the house comes down and entombs them both inside. The raven atop the rubble for Dupin to see, but he realizes that he doesn't care about any of Roderick's reasonings. In the end, his thoughts don't deserve to be heard. All topped off with Poe's Spirits of the Dead, how that cycle of life and death can never be stopped, how those two states are connected. Similar to the poem, Roderick finds himself visited by the dead, but rather than guiding him over, it feels sinister. His children are not happy. Nothing good is waiting for him in death. And while I believe that the show is very clear and that everything that's happening is real, especially where Dupin specifically sees the raven at the end, it would be just as easy to suggest that other than the deaths, all of this was just the effects of Roderick's declining sanity. We are, after all, only hearing the story from what Roderick believes he's been told. The system's just geared to protect people in his position. He doesn't need otherworldly intervention, it's just as likely his brains fabricated a deeper story around this bartender he met the night they committed murder. And as outlandishly absurd as the deaths are, they're all possible. Perry's an idiot who didn't do basic research, Leo does too many drugs, Camille was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so on. The only one that really doesn't work is Lenore. A deal made in a bar could easily be the way a man chooses to feel better about the legacy he's left, to accept some of the guilt without ever fully having to atone for what he's done. If he had just lived a good and happy life with Annabelle, he'd be rich in the ways that matter. Instead, their legacy is decimated and their immortality is scorned. Unreliable narrators are a regular occurrence in Poe's work, including some of the ones we've seen here. It wouldn't be outlandish for all of this to be the delusions of a man looking for answers, because how else could his empire crumble so quickly? Though again, in the confines of the show, I do think it all really happened. I'm just pointing out that no supernatural force is needed to be involved in this. But that's pretty much it. So many thoughts on this show. Obviously, things I didn't mention, like the bar having visual nods to the stories and Poe himself, Longfellow being the name of one of Poe's other contemporaries he had a one-sided feud with, Morella being the name of a bedridden woman, and the dynamic of the husband. I don't even think I mentioned that August had lied about their being an usher informant to rattle the family, meaning that for a while he was blaming himself for those deaths? No one died for your lie, so don't carry that. I just love how this story works on so many levels, of one family's greed and entitlement, how that ties into the devastation they cause with that greed, paralleling our real-life opioid epidemic, the people that played into it, and other elites, how humanity can be so damn destructive, while also making sure to bring it back to so much of the good that we can achieve as well, how it's all about the choices we make, both small and big, and what they become. But that's pretty much gonna do it for this video. Again, I just really love how this show works so well as a horror show, as something that kind of has more a meta-narrative going on. I thought it was really well handled. If you guys have caught the show, let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Uh, I know I've taken so many notes and some things probably got left out of this final version, so if there's other thoughts you have, feel free to let me know. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members who are the official sponsors of this video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Thing. All my social medias are listed down below if you want to follow me there for updates. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.